the microphones here. Um, let's see. It looks like we got a pretty good turnout today. Uh, how many of you are familiar with permaculture? <coughs> got some permaculture people, huh? All right. Uh, how many of you have taken a class on that? Just a hand. Okay. No. A little bit from Tom, Tom talked about it in, a, in the uh, plant classes in Southwestern. Great. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more background where I'm coming from. Um, as, as you heard, uh, I have a master's degree in ecological landscape design. Um, after completing that, I started up my own landscape company called Eden on Earth, and I was based in northern Arizona. And what we did was we installed uh, permaculture-based landscapes uh, with a specialty in uh, rainwater harvesting and gray water type systems. Um, we then used that water to irrigate these edible landscapes. Can you hear me all right with this thing? Okay. Um, and so last year I moved back here to San Diego where I grew up and we have just started the San Diego Sustainable Living Institute. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. This is our first week, essentially, in operation. Uh, our kickoff was actually at the Earth Fair this last weekend. Um, so what we do is we're a, we're a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit uh, organization under the One to One movement. And uh, our mission is to teach hands-on sustainable living skills. Right? So to kind of provide one type of uh, school where people can learn anything that they want to about sustainable living, whether it's permaculture, water harvesting, gray water systems, natural building, uh, beekeeping, chickens, all that kind of stuff. So that's, hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more from us in the future. Um, this talk today is going to be more or less on permaculture and its uh, uh, technique of food forestry. Okay. So I'm going to touch on this talk here a little bit about what permaculture is. Um, we're going to get into ecology as it applies to uh, planting out a food forest. I'm going to compare this with kind of traditional type agriculture, traditional orchard type systems. And uh, then look at how we can create our own food forests in our own backyards or our own orchards, farms, all of that. And finally, just kind of wrapping it up with just some examples of food forests throughout San Diego. Okay, So that's kind of the outline for tonight. Um, permaculture is a design system that's based on understanding ecosystems, right? Understanding how things fit together, okay? And it's a design system, so it takes these different parts of whatever we're designing, whether it's a business or a garden, um, and looks at how we can kind of create functional relationships between those pieces, right? Because the strength of any ecosystem isn't in the pieces, it's in the connection between them, right? So how do we learn this kind of stuff? We go out and we hike in nature, right? And we, we look at the different patterns that you see that happen between the different plants themselves, right? Or the different... Uh, uh, trees and their interactions with the fungal communities, the bacteria, the different animals, and just the plants themselves. Right? They, how are they growing together? What plants grow next to what other plants? Why do they do that? And, you know, we ask all these kinds of questions. Right? Um, we stand back and we look at it as a whole. Right? These are natural systems. Every place around the world, when we start to think about how do we design our own gardens, we should be first going out and hiking in our local communities, right? So mission trails. I love this kind of stuff, right? When you're looking at a landscape like this, I'm always blown away at just the, the mere productivity and you know sheer beauty of it. But nobody's out here watering it, fertilizing it, pruning it, weeding it, planting it, or doing anything. And yet there it is in its abundance, and it continues to kind of thrive year after year with minimal care. Right? And that's because every piece of that is kind of working together. Right? They're helping each other out. So much of what you might have heard with you know, the Darwin theory, you know, survival of the fittest, uh, really what we're seeing is actually a survival of uh, those organisms that continue to kind of work together. Right? Those that uh, 
uh, help one another are the ones that are actually moving forward. Okay. So when we compare natural systems to things like traditional orchard systems, you'll notice there's a stark difference, right? Um, this could be taken anywhere, and this could be any orchard system that we might see throughout really the world these days. Um, but one of the things I want to point out is one, there's one plant that we're predominantly seeing, right? So it's a you know peach tree or a you know, avocado orchard, or A, this and that. Maybe, you know, you even mix it up and you have a few different fruit trees, but they're still, they're all planted out, you know, 15 foot centers or, or whatever, and it's in a geometric pattern to stack as much uh, plants in there to give them just the precise amount of uh, sunlight. And then the management of that, everything about it has to be brought in, right? So we have to, uh, you know, provide all the pest control, all the fertilizing for it. Uh, you have to do all the pruning. If there's any sort of, you know, bug or anything like that that you have to kind of watch out for, you're in there, and you have a very hands-on approach, right? And if you do end up with a disease, uh, chances are it's going to spread very quickly, tree after tree, right? So that's why you have to be on it. Um, but when we look at the and step back here one second too. Um, this type of agriculture is really based on uh, a European model of agriculture, right? So when the Europeans came uh, to, to North America, they brought their styles of agriculture with them. Uh, North America's climate is quite a bit different, uh, particularly here in Southern California, uh, than what you're seeing in a lot of those places over that way. You know, I guess more similar to uh, like a southern France or, or Spain, you know, Mediterranean type climates. Um, traditional agriculture in North America with native peoples, when we look at this, we have to imagine that for thousands of years, this is actually a garden, right? Native peoples managed landscapes in a much different way than we do now. Um, if you read some of the first accounts of, of European settlers coming into uh, North America in the 1500s, all of them wrote about the bounty of food plants that they came across when they were in the, in the country. They'd walk around and they were just amazed that on, all along these trails were fruit trees, there were nut trees, there were different edible kinds of berries, all sorts of stuff. Uh, game was plentiful, uh, fish were super bountiful all over. What they didn't realize is that native peoples have been managing for those conditions and planting those things that they wanted to see. Right? And it, maybe it was, in, it was in a different way than we plant, right? different way than they were used to planting. Uh, a lot of Native American stuff was done by, by fire or just selecting those types of plants that you eat and uh, you know, planting up seeds as you're going, uh, selecting for the, that bigger fruit or that uh, tastier berry or whatnot. Um, more and more they're discovering that throughout all of the Americas, you know, native peoples have been managing those areas as kind of like a forest type agriculture. Right? It's, it's less intensive and it blends more in with the natural ecologies. And so, you know, when anthropologists kind of look at all these areas, they don't quite see that those are actually gardens. It's just tended in a different way. It's more of a, more of a horticultural practice rather than an agricultural kind of approach. So the, the idea of the permaculture food forest is really trying to kind of mimic some of the indigenous practices as well as blend it into whatever ecosystem we're in. So we look at what ecosystem are we in, we observe how those plants want to grow, and then we try to mimic how we plant. Okay? Um, any ecosystem that we go to, we're going to find that there's sort of patterns that begin to emerge in the vegetation. Right? So you're going to have a kind of a tree layer. You know, if you're in the desert, this might not be very tall. Uh, the wetter the climate, the taller the trees kind of thing. 
Uh, then you've got the tall trees, you're going to have small trees, you're going to have shrubs, you're going to have ground cover, herbs, uh, there's whole root kind of layers going on. And what they're doing is they're taking full advantage of all the, the, the space possible. Right? Many types of agriculture, particularly gardens and, and orchards, really only focus on a two-dimensional kind of approach. Right? So they're just looking at how we can plant from here to the wall or back that way and how many trees we can space out. Uh, what they're not thinking about is that vertical dimension. Right? So when we start thinking vertically, then all of a sudden, you know, one, we can get more production out of a smaller space. Uh, but two, we're, we're making those plants actually uh, take more advantage of the available sunlight. So a tree, for instance, um, even though they're great at photosynthesizing, uh, turning that sunlight into kind of a you know, sugar glucose based uh, uh, fuel, they, they can only convert about 30% of that solar energy into actual food. You know, after that, they, what's known as solar saturation, they just kind of max out. Uh, when you start packing in different layers, you can almost get closer and closer to that 100% uh, you know, solar energy. We're actually taking all that and actually converting it into uh, to usable products. Okay. And this will make a little bit more sense as we get more into the specifics of uh, creating the food forest. So this is known as like the, the seven layers of a, of a food forest. And this applies in any ecosystem. Okay. So another thing we want to look at is what plants do. Right? So a lot of times, uh, when we're planting out things, we tend to think about, well, what, what do we like to eat? Um, and we're thinking of just one thing, right? We're thinking of that fruit, okay? Um, but really, in, in terms of ecosystem services, like what plants actually do for the rest of the ecosystem, there's so much. And that's what I really want you to kind of think about when we're planting out our different types of plants and arranging them accordingly, is look at all those kinds of things. Um, you know, plants are harvesting their own water. They're slowing it down. They're stopping erosion when it rains. They're building soil by, uh, you know, either fixing nitrogen, dropping leaf matter, uh, fostering all sorts of microbial life, breaking up compacted soils. I mean, literally, you can go on and on, like a single tree can perform over a hundred different ecological services. Okay. As we move into more kind of specific arranging plants, a lot of you have probably heard of the Three Sisters type garden. And this is a, a guild of plants. And a guild is basically just a grouping of different plants that work together and create something that's uh, more harmonious and uh, more production <coughs> then they would be just grown on their own. Right? So in the tr tra traditional Three Sisters, you have corn, which grows very tall. Uh, corn happens to need a lot of nitrogen to grow. Right? So you plant beans next to the corn, and the corn's about you know, yay high. And the beans fix nitrogen. Right? And, but the beans also want a place to kind of grow, so the corn provides that living trellis for the beans. What's that? Is there a question? Um, and lastly, you have the squash. And the squash grow kind of just along the ground. And what they do is they shade that soil. Right? Uh, they also need a little bit of nitrogen. And so they, they also benefit from the beans. Uh, but together, what they've created is they maximize that space. Right? Rather than just growing corn all by itself and just getting one product, what you're getting out of here is three different products in the same space and each of them doing a little bit better than if they were grown by themselves. Okay. Uh, what you see there on the, the right is the Rocky Mountain bee plant, Cleomy cerulata, which is also known as the fourth sister, which was there to attract beneficial insects and pollinators. Right? The corn being wind pollinated, but the beans and squash need a, an actual pollinator. So they're trying to attract those things to then pollinate their crops. What did you say that was? Uh, Rocky Mountain bee plant. And uh, they're now able to find a lot of indigenous uh, uh, old structures and, and home sites by the presence of that plant. 
You know, it's still self-seeding and all that around some of these little Native American sites uh, throughout the Southwest. Okay. Now, when we take those ideas and we apply them more to kind of a perennial-based system, because right, the food forest uh, is trying to kind of more or less make things a lot easier for us in terms of management and getting a lot more production out of it. So we tend to want to focus on longer-lived uh, perennial species, that once they're established, there's a lot less work and we kind of step back. So as we begin to kind of work around and create our own food forest, if you just think in terms of these five things here, uh, and beginning to kind of arrange your other plants, and I'll kind of walk you through how this works here in a second. Um, first, we want to bring in kind of like insect and bird attractors. Right? These things are not only going to be uh, helping with pollination, but we want tons of beneficial insects that are going to predate on all the other pests that we have. Right? We're trying to get a diversity, right? not relying on any one particular thing, because the, you know, the, the strength is really going to be in the, the overall cumulative diversity. We want to have plants that are bringing in nutrients from deep down into that soil. Right? Deep down there, we have a ton of minerals, uh, but a lot of plants can't quite get to them, and certain plants are really well adapted to bringing up specific minerals from down there and bringing it up into its leaf tissue, and then when those leaves fall, they get deposited right on that soil surface, and the biology helps break that down and makes it available for the rest of the plants. So certain plants, like you see down there in the bottom center there, that big leafy one, comfrey, uh, is often talked about in kind of the permaculture community as being a great uh, multifunctional plant. One, because it's known to bring up at least six different minerals from down in the soil, has a deep tap root, uh, and all of that. So it's fantastic. Um, now of the nutrient accumulators, one of them that we really try to focus on are the uh, nitrogen fixing plants. So those plants have formed a relationship with soil bacteria that are able to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form that plants can actually uptake. Right? So we specifically uh, segment out the nitrogen fixers, fixers of the dynamic accumulators, the nutrient accumulators, and try to go heavily on that. So those plants tend to be in the legume family. Right? So you're being kind of plants, and I'll get specifically <coughs> into that here in a second. Um, we want plants that are you know, providing habitat. Right? So these could just be kind of bushy type things. It could be things around the, the edge of our garden, just providing habitat for lizards, birds, uh, all of these kinds of things. We, we're not trying to eliminate you know, any particular thing from our garden. Right? We want to have a whole diversity. Because right? we don't necessarily have problems once you kind of provide uh, the, the right conditions where there is a pest, something else is going to predate on it and never gets really out of control. Okay. And lastly, you know, we want plants that produce a ton of mulch. Okay. Because in the ecological garden, uh, we want to not have to bring in stuff from off-site. Right. Particularly as we're thinking in terms of climate change and peak oil, where a lot of these resources that we have right now with free mulch at the dump and this and that. Well, one, you don't know where that stuff comes from, and you know, as uh, I was hearing a lot of talk of the systemic uh, pesticides and stuff like that, well, that stuff can really persist in, in your mulch. And if you start putting that in your garden, you can literally be killing plants. Um, by growing your own, you know exactly where it's at, and it doesn't have to travel far. This is like taking kind of local food production to that next level. Right? Not only is it local food production, but local mulch production. Okay. So of the nitrogen fixing plants, I just wanted to kind of throw out some that uh, can commonly be used here in Southern California. Uh, Tipuana tipu in the top there. Uh, fantastic, very fast growing, uh, pretty drought tolerant uh, legume that's often used all around town as a more of a, a decorative tree, right? a shade tree. Um, grows super easy from seed. Um, jacaranda is another one. Uh, cassia type plants, mimosa, sweet pea shrub, mesquites, palaverdes as we start to move further uh, 
uh, towards the deserts. Uh, and then Ceanothus, which is not a legume, but it's one of those plants that's been known to fix nitrogen. It has a, uh, a different association with another type of bacteria that uh, allows for that. So there's many more. You know, start to kind of look at it. There's very few legumes that actually don't fix nitrogen. Uh, carob is one that I've uh, read about that is known to not fix nitrogen, but still a legume. Uh, honey locust would be another. So as we start to kind of look at putting these pieces together, we might start with a single fruit tree, right? And then orange, lemon, whatever you want, you know, based on what your climate allows you to grow there, or based on what your water resources allow you to grow there. Um, what you then do is then look at all those pieces that we're just looking at back here and begin to kind of pack those in around your fruit tree. Um, so you add in your nitrogen fixers. Uh, you add in your dynamic accumulators. You add in your mulch plants. And you kind of arrange it so that each plant, you kind of think about it, and it's like, well, okay, this plant here wants a little bit more shade. This one wants a little bit more sun. This is fast growing here. Um, and we're always planting way more than we're actually going to use because we're planning for succession. Right? This is a long-term kind of uh, process. Right? It takes a long while to go from bare ground to a, a forest type system. And so really in this early stage, given that San Diego soils are very horrible on the most part, right, we really need to work on building our soil first and foremost. Okay? So that's why we go so heavy. Um, Ten support plants for every fruit tree. Right? You can even plant these out way before you do your fruit trees. You know, start getting all that in there. They're sacrificial for the most part. Or they might be phased in. Uh, you know, I'm showing an artichoke here. An artichoke might only live for you know, that three to four years. Right? Then it either gets shaded out or just dies off. Uh, the cassia, which I brought two of for the, uh, the table here. So if you're wondering why there's some non-fruiting plants up here, uh, because they're nitrogen fixing uh, support plants. Um, so you start to kind of pack all that in there. You're taking advantage of the space. Okay. Here's kind of an example of a uh, garden. This is one of my old gardens in Flagstaff. We have a, a small column in our apple tree, right? These just go kind of straight up. Um, you have mulch plants, you know, you have your comfrey, you have uh, currants, so fruiting plants there. You have even vines growing up. Catnip, which is going to be kind of a, a pest confusing plant, right? But it's also good for tea, it's good for, uh, um, you know, cats love it, obviously. Um, Daylilies, edible portions there. And you can see here that every part of that area is kind of filled in. And that's what we're going for. When, you know, when it rains, that water's not directly hitting that soil. It's slowed down at each point. Uh, we have a very thickly mulched soil. So we're fostering the, the soil food web. We're kind of building that. Year after year, these plants are going to be growing better and better. And our management of it is literally kind of coming in here and just with a machete or you know, a pair of loppers or whatever and just kind of cutting that stuff back and putting it right down there where it falls. Okay. Um, here's kind of looking at another one up in Northern California. This is uh, Penny Livingston's old place in uh, uh, Point Reyes Station. And we look at this. And obviously it's a wetter climate than we have here, so the plants that they're using are obviously going to be different. Um, but the, the pattern and the ideas are still the same. Uh, we have trees, we have shrubs, we have all the mulch that we can ever produce. Uh, this thing, at this point, is no longer irrigated, and again, the only maintenance is coming in there with a machete and literally just cutting things that you don't want there, like the, the comfrey, if that gets out of control, well, it just turns into more mulch. Um, when I've been through there, it's really amazing because you have the fruit trees growing up and there's all sorts of currants and all, all that kind of stuff. So your harvesting becomes more like a foraging activity. Right? You walk through and you're harvesting uh, you know, handfuls of this and bushels of that. And so what you end up with, there's literally a whole diversity of crops rather than just one crop. Right? 
And it's a lot less work with a lot less problems from diseases and other types of pests. Okay. So while we're talking about pruning, I just want to kind of uh, get you to think about uh, the effects of this type of uh, uh, mulching as opposed to bringing in surface types of mulch. So when we bring in mulch and we just put it on the surface, that's great, right? We're actually, we're building the soil and the, we're, we're allowing the worms and the different microbes to kind of break that up and, and take it down further, deeper into the soil. But if we want to really kickstart soil production, really get things revved up and get deep soils very fast, we have to think about getting it down in there in the least uh, offensive and, and without tilling it in, letting nature kind of do the work. What we're doing here is we're kind of acting like the, the orchestrator of, of this garden and we're making things actually go much faster than you'd see in nature. Right? We could build soil uh, very quickly with the right uh, tools and knowledge. So when we look at a tree, you know, we only see those above ground portions, right? Just the trunk, the leaves, the branches. But what we don't see is that root mass that's down below that soil surface, right? And typically, this is going to be as much, if not greater, than the parts that are above ground. And okay? so you just have to think about it. All that above ground mass is also below ground. Now, trees are amazing, and shrubs, plants in general. When you prune them, when you cut off some of their vegetation, some of that root mass down below also dies off to compensate for what you just took off. Right? So every time that we take branches off here, roots are falling off, and we're thereby mulching the soil deep down. You know, how far do uh, tree roots go? You know, studies are showing that they keep digging further and further down and, you know, hundreds, a couple hundred feet, they're still finding roots, right? So as we do this, we're, we're pruning off, we're creating deeper soils, and the mulch that we pull from off here, because this tree, or this shrub, is planted right next to our fruit trees, we take that and we mulch the base of our fruit trees, okay? Um, so the plants that we're using here, you know, if they're nitrogen fixing or fast growing, we're selecting those that are going to be really fast growing that uh, we can keep coming back all the time, or that at least is our preference. Okay. Um, and so what we're, we're doing here is we're looking in terms of ecological succession, uh, you know, moving from this low succession kind of point and trying to move to something that's a little bit more complex. Uh, that functions more like an ecosystem so that we don't have to harvest, or, I'm sorry, we don't have to work as much. Right? Our harvests are going to be greater, cumulatively. Right? So the permaculture food forest idea um, differs from conventional agriculture. In conventional agriculture, you're only thinking of the fruit, right? which we kind of talked about. You're not thinking about all the other products. So with this idea of a food forest, we're valuing not only the fruit, uh, but all those other ecological services. We're, va we're uh, valuing the soil production of our gardens. Like, are they getting better every year, or are they getting worse? If things are getting worse, and even organic agriculture is, uh, when you're growing uh, in kind of a standard uh, row type system uh, can be ecologically detrimental. Right? You can actually destroy landscapes, even if it's organic. Um, or at least things aren't getting better. What we're trying to do is actually reverse that and kind of rehabilitate landscapes so that they do get better and you can grow more. Okay? So uh, just to kind of end here with some slides going through of different ones. This is a Bailey residence in Lakeside. Um, this was a hillside that's just yeah, at the beginning stages here, just got terraced, so it's holding rainwater, uh, no, no erosion that way. Uh, one time input of mulch, right? So bringing all that in, just landfill mulch, and all the plants kind of going in at once. So focusing on perennials, so you have guava trees, you have uh, stone fruit, you have uh, you know, different sages, all that kind of stuff. Um, as they start to kind of fill in, he's already getting harvests of different types of, uh, 
uh, fruits. Um, in the open spaces that are around, mixing up some annual uh, peppers or uh, squash or whatever you can, just to kind of fill it in. You want a, you want a full space that's shaded, less evaporation, all of that. Um, and this is it as you see it today, where it's kind of starting to kind of more or less at this point really resemble what you might see if you're hiking kind of along uh, a shaded ravine somewhere in San Diego. You know, it's different plants, of course, but those the function of those is pretty similar, right? You got the taller trees beginning to kind of emerge, um, completely covered. Now at this point, you have uh, some culinary sages, some culinary rosemary, uh, different types of edible flowers. Uh, the annual crops are more or less kind of phased out at this point or moving a little bit closer to the house. Uh, but the work now involved for this is at a minimum. Right? He literally just kind of prunes out some stuff. If he wants to increase production, uh, you know, you can open up a little bit more sunlight to foster in that, uh, that growth to one area, uh, but very minimal. Okay. Another look at a different type of uh, system in Hamul. Uh, this one has a number of different fruit trees, uh, all planted in kind of water harvesting earthworks. So the, the patio here drains water off. That irrigates this whole area here. Number of shrubs going in, um, you know, edible nasturtiums, great for ground cover, all that kind of stuff. Great for confusing pests, you know, with the different smells and all that kind of stuff. Um, what's that? Okay. Um, another type or expression of a food forest can be thought of at the. Uh, yeah, the gravel, isn't it kind of, it's pretty big. Yeah. Isn't, isn't pea gravel maybe something to look for? Um, I mean, in terms of, they're not planting in that. You know, that's more or less the pathway. For walking, you know. Yeah, I, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's what they want. Um, you know, the, the whole thing here is, you know, the raised pathway also drains water off. So when it's draining all that water from up here, it goes down to you know either side and, and drains off. So it's a passively irrigated landscape. You know, it's citrus trees and stuff in there at this point are pretty much entirely rainwater fed. Which is pretty pretty amazing for Southern California. At Cuyamaca, they have some uh, per permeable uh, blacktop. Yep. Water goes through. Oh really? Mm-hmm. It's on display over there. In there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not talking too much about rainwater harvesting, and obviously that's going to be a whole other talk, and there's so many different ways to kind of go about it. Um, you know, I touch upon it because I think it's so important, you know, when we're trying to think about growing food, we don't want to really exceed our water budget. We want to try to stay within that, and so we're selecting plants that are, you know, appropriate to our regions, whether we have enough gray water to support uh, more of those water-loving things. Uh, the further away we get from water resources, the, our plant selection begins to kind of taper off to those plants that are suited to those drier kind of conditions. Okay, so the more like the pomegranates, olives, the jubies, um, and a whole host of, you know, you all here are like the real fruit tree experts. Uh, I'm just hoping to kind of bring in how to kind of put some of these together. All right, so seeds at city. Uh, this is a different expression of a food forest. Uh, how many of you been there? See the city? This is where the only handful, okay. Um, it's a relatively new garden, I think probably not older than three years. Uh, converted from an old lawn, right? And now it's producing boatloads of food. Um, what you're seeing here is mostly a whole uh, conglomeration of different annual uh, and, and some perennial type crops, but they've intercropped with tons of fruit trees, right? So over time, this is gonna change from what we see here to more of a perennial based system. They're not using a lot of like the support plants and stuff that we're talking about, but it's a highly managed way to go, right? Because they're dealing with tons of organic matter that they're composting on site. They're able to kind of build their soil by huge applications of compost, right? But over time, this is going to kind of shift, and if they want to, they can start to prune up their fruit trees to kind of keep them smaller. I mean, tons of them. If you get a chance, check it out. 
and try to support their organization. They're doing a lot of really, really good uh, uh, training the next generation of... Uh, where, where is it at City College? Uh, who can answer that? Like in terms what of... What part of the college campus? campus? The south side, south side of the campus. Okay. By the library. By the library. Yeah, I, I only know this It's not spot. near the new building, so they're building that. Mm, same side. By the teacher's parking lot. Yep. There's actually three. So uh, then, is it uh, right near the theater? One of them. One of them is off of uh, C Street, uh, and I think that may be what you're looking at there. There's another one that's farther north that's uh, quite large, and then they have a third one which is more of a uh, natural garden area where they're pulling in for their butterflies and things. Yeah. Th th this was their kind of main one, right? I guess on C Street, or just on C Street. Um, so the last one we're going to look at here is uh, a, a before and after uh, picture of a larger acreage uh, in Fallbrook. This is the Diane Kennedy's uh, place, if you know her. Um, she's lived there for quite a while. This picture was taken last year. Um, and as you can see, I mean, just looking at it, you can tell that this is on a very low ecological succession, right? Mostly weed species, hard compacted soils, there's not going to be a lot of uh, you know, diversity in there. It's going to be really hard to kind of grow much. Um, and then just a couple of uh, you know, fan palms. Not too exciting. Uh, but she has a lot of potential for water kind of cruising down through uh, properties above her. And uh, what she has done is kind of take some of those, you know, began to harvest the water and then all at once planted out uh, a lot of different things. So looking at it, and this is one of the things that's really hard to kind of understand when I'm showing you pictures of a food forest, is you have to kind of walk through them to really understand what's happening. Because when we look at this, or when I look at this, I just see a bunch of plants and it's like, what the hell is that? Um, so you have to kind of decipher, like, well, what's, what, what are the interactions here? And so, you know, as we move a little bit closer in here, you can kind of see it. there's things just kind of all over. One, you know, she's modified the site, it's two acres, to be not just a single uh, microclimate that's hot, dry, and weedy, right? So she's harvested the water to slow it down at each point along the way, uh, creating kind of a meadow ecosystem and a forest ecosystem. And then down at the bottom, she has a couple of rainwater fed ponds. So kind of aquatic ecosystems as well. Now, anybody that studied ecology will know that you know, the, the most productive ecosystems aren't the forests, they aren't the meadows, they aren't the oceans or the waterways. It's where those two ecosystems come together, right? The ecotone, or uh, it's called the edge effect in permaculture. And so what she's done is created multiple edges that are going to give more production. Right? When we're out in a forest and we're wondering, well, where's the you know, the most production in that forest, it's always going to be at the edge, right, where that sunlight can penetrate a little bit more and the berries begin to grow. You know, all berries are pretty much a, an edge type species, right? So she's recreated that here. She's got meadows, she's got forest, and then within that, you know, things like the clumping bamboo growing next to the banana, growing next to the nitrogen fixing tree with the small dwarfing citrus down below, um, ground covers, um, passion fruit kind of going amount amongst them. Uh, in the summertime, she grows winter squash right now, and they just kind of take over as a living ground cover. Um, very amazing, very beautiful, uh, and already at this point, very productive, and the soils are only going to continue to get better. Um, I'll just kind of make one more note. So bamboo, you know, clumping bamboo, dropping huge amounts of organic matter, mulching the surface that way. Um, nitrogen fixing tree that could be cut down um, and I will throw in one more plug for nitrogen fixing uh, trees here uh, a lot of times you know we do get so excited with the fruit trees that we tend to go really high on those um, we'll tend to get more production if we can actually go higher on those support species at the beginning right plant out more of those nitrogen fixing trees. Give us some examples, yeah. besides the calcium. 
Uh, well, the Tipuana Tipu, the mesquites, the uh, jacarandas, the um, acacia species, um, sweet pecia, if you're going more of that ornamental type look. Um, basically, you know, there's probably thousands of different ones that you can grow right here in San Diego County. Yeah. So, do you have some guidelines on your web on that? Not yet. Okay. Uh, the website will have a discussion forum, and I think that might be a great, great one to put on there. Um, okay, so this is still on the same property. Uh, lower down, you can see we're incorporating more of that ornamental look, but this is the bee garden. Uh, lower in elevation, gets more chill hours, so this is kind of where the uh, uh, stone fruits have gone. All right, so she has probably 15 different stone fruits in that area. Um, and it's more in a Mediterranean style of uh, food forest. So a lot more of the uh, uh, lower water use kind of stuff, you know, uh, sages, um, lavenders, geraniums, um, Couple of beehives in there, it's the bee garden as well. Very multifunctional. Lots of products out of it. And that's the one thing, there's never a shortage of food or fiber or building materials or mulch in a food forest. All that's designed into it. Okay. All right. Well, that is pretty much the, the talk I have for you tonight. Obviously, it's a big uh, topic and you can go kind of on and on. There's a lot more to learn. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have this new organization. We have tons of classes coming up here all the time. Uh, coming up, we have a laundry to landscape gray water class. We have organic gardening classes. Uh, permaculture design course starting up, which is a 12-day one. Uh, beekeeping, chickens, all that kind of stuff are going to be offered. If you want to learn more, come check out our website. Uh, if you have a little smartphone, you can scan that right there and get you, you, can get you right in. Um, so at this point, I'll just kind of open it up for questions. Uh, I have a lot of parsley. I just let it seed and grow later on. And I just planted a bare root in the orchard. And I've got a bunch of parsley and I was pulling it because I thought it's got deep roots and it would be taking water away from my fruit trees. Is that true or not? No, the parsley is a fantastic one. When you think of like, you know, when it flowers, uh, it's in the, the almond family, right? And so those types of flowers seem to attract a lot of beneficial insects that predate on all sorts of things. Plus that deep tap root doesn't compete at all with your fruit trees. No, they're, it's, it's fantastic. It's going to break up some compaction, all that, and it's an edible component. Uh, and, and in many cases, it's going to be a self-seeding uh, feature of your garden. So if I have that and mustard and stinging nettles and uh, lamb's quarters and all that stuff coming up underneath the fruit trees, that's all right? It is. Uh, it's telling you a couple things. It's telling you that your soils are compacted um, and not very good. You know, one, because those are all early pioneer type plants. Um, you know, once, if you were to mulch heavily, you know, some of those would kind of begin to phase out. Uh, if you plant more woody types of plants, so a lot, of, a lot of our fruit trees, the soil that they want is different than what the weeds want to grow in, and it's different than what your vegetables want to grow in. Uh, those are very highly uh, bacterial dominated familiar with like the soil food web and so more woody plants try to encourage a more fungal dominated soils that actually benefit your fruit trees more um, so what you have basically are kind of like a low succession one if you start to get more woody plants in there uh, more mulch okay I, I, I don't know what you mean by woody plants give me some examples um, that's going to be like you know trees and shrubs the, the branches are actually woody as opposed to like a, a, your parsley for instance which is uh, just herbaceous, it's, it breaks off, there's no wood. So you're telling me to grow trees other than fruit trees by my fruit trees? Is that what you're telling me? To really benefit them, but you mean, it depends what, you're trying, what your goals are. I mean right now, and when I showed you with the seeds at, at City One, that was a kind of a food forest with a lot of vegetable kind of crops in there. All of those plants work with your, your current situation. Um, not in limited space, I don't think so. In what way? In what way? Look, you got a big tree, are you going to get enough 
sun on your root trees? You, you don't necessarily let it get that big. You manage the height of, and that's that's often a, a, the question here is, you know, are your nitrogen fixing trees or other trees that you're planting going to overgrow your your uh, fruit trees? Um, and that's where your management comes in. That's where you're pruning them out. If they ever start to compete, that's why they're sacrificial. They just go by the wayside. So you could grow them, <clears throat> grow them up to provide a little bit of shade, but if it's too much, then they get the, the, the machete or the axe or the, the lopping shears. And that's so you down. manage that with, you lace them, you skirt them up so that you get lights coming through and underneath, penetrating through the canopy becomes an upper canopy plant, and it provides a, a cooler ecosystem below it, but still provides adequate light. So, yeah, you do some management, and you allow it to. You don't just let it dominate. Yep. Uh, I tried in the but the point is, I don't get the trees if I get any vegetable or a smaller new water. And I don't necessarily want to give that much water to my food. Then well, you want to kind of group your plants according to their water needs. Can you uh, say, summarize the question? Uh, yeah, so she was asking about, uh, she has a fruit tree, and I guess it's a, more of a lower water use kind of plant, and she was worried about putting higher water use, uh, like annual veggies under that. Um, and to, I mean, to answer it is more or less, you kind of group, try to group your plants more or less according to their water needs. So that. You know, your, your annual veggies, because they also need more care, should be located closer to the house where you do have more of those water resources. As you move further and further out, some of those begin to phase out or the vegetables that you are using are a little bit uh, hardier or less frequent or less harvested. Uh, I had a very bad experience with a couple of papaya trees that were beautiful, growing tall, but then I have alfalfa underneath, and I didn't realize that alfalfa, when it grows big, the roots are thick and deep. So I suspect they are too covered and fall for nutrients. So my papaya trees start dying, and the alfalfa is growing huge. So uh, what is your opinion? Uh, the question here is about uh, a couple of papaya trees and alfalfa growing up and wondering if that was in the papaya trees kind of dying off and wondering if that was the cause of it. It's hard to say. I mean, I, know, I do know alfalfa has been grown uh, as, as a uh, intercrop between a lot of orchard trees throughout the world um, and it's shown great success. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. Uh, and like you said, very deep tap roots, which is great biomass because as you cut that, all that root mass also drops off into the surface. So, do you have any experience with, with that in particular? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if the alfalfa is killing your papaya. There are a lot of other things that can be going on, especially during cold, wet soils in the winter time, because the, the biomass of the alfalfa is keeping that soil cooler, preventing it from, from warming from the sun, solar energy, and that cold, wet soil can be causing the problems on your papaya, not directly because of the alfalfa, but because of the, the transition in the environment that's being created by that. So an option would be to cut that alfalfa low around the papaya in the immediate vicinity of the trunk to allow the solar energy to warm that soil, to let the water evaporate near the base of that, I don't think it's it's directly because of the root system competition, but because of the interaction. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Sure. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm going to jump up. I use uh, gray water safe laundry soap for my washing machine. I have not been able to find a gray water safe dishwashing detergent for my dishwasher that works well. Would you recommend one? Uh, so this is a question about gray water um, and uh, the soap detergents. Well, one, your dishwasher is technically not a legal source of gray water in San Diego. Um, and anytime you use, which I'm all for, you know, it's great water. 
Uh, however, your dishwasher, ten, all soaps for dishwasher tend to be very caustic for plants. Um, so if you do want to use your kitchen sink for gray water, I would recommend hand washing your dishes and using a, a soap that doesn't have uh, uh, any types of salt in it. Uh, Oasis brand, uh, BioPack, Dr. Bronner's would all be uh, great options for that. How about ground covers? Like I use hairy vetch and amaranth. Are those things good for nitrogen fixing too? Great. Uh, well, yeah, the hairy vetch is good. Amaranth is not a nitrogen fixer, but it will add a lot of biomass. Uh, you know, self seeding. You know, all of those are going to be great in the early stages, or depending on like if you're trying to go for more of a forest look or more of kind of like an open look. You know, those could be around for a while. Yep. And last year we started using mycorrhiza a lot in the fruit for our fruit trees, but you know to fix the bacteria on the roots is that something that would also benefit our plants, like what you're mentioning too. Yeah, I mean if your if your soil needs an inoculant uh, to kind of get some of those uh, mycorrhizal associations going, great. Otherwise, um, all the all the studies are pointing to if you provide the habitat for those, i.e., mulching with woody types of matter, wood chips and all that kind of stuff, those mycorrhizal uh, fungal components will all these, they'll, they'll just show up from the air and wind and all that. Add some mulch worms, it'll help make your mycorrhizal. It's a field yep. of dreams. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah. 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 Josh, do you have um, lists of different categories of plants? Accumulators, the habitat provider that are specifically suited for this region? No. Uh, that is something that I think every community benefits from is beginning to kind of put things together. And I believe some people in town are probably thinking about that. A lot of it just comes from observation or, or knowing the different plants that. Uh, uh, what families they're from and what types of uh, you know ecological functions that they perform. There. John Mollison's book on permaculture has listings of a lot of the different groups of plants that you're asking for, and then if you go to your local nursery, they'll be able to help you with what is suited for this environment. Um, that would be a good starting point for you. Nitrogen fixing trees better than all the peas and beans I'm planting all around my yard because I can eat those. You can eat them. Um, what's what's nice about the, uh, the trees and shrubs once they're established, there's barely any water in it if you're choosing appropriate species. Um, they're going to be a longer term source of the mulch rather than you have to be planting them year after year. So it depends on, you know, a lot of permaculture is it depends, like what are your goals? Um, you know, again, the, the, the more woodier types of plant materials are going to be better for the long-term health of your, your plants because you're trying to foster more of that uh, mycorrhizal uh, interactions under the soil. But your peas, your beans, all that, uh, still have a place in there. They can be worked in into the edges. Some nitrogen fixing plants um, are also going to be, be edible. Um, so you just have to kind of look around. You know, mesquite, for instance, uh, the pods are nice ground up, and it's a beautiful food source throughout the Southwest. Another thing you should think about that, you know, with your fruit trees, and, and here's a good example in my yard. My fruit trees, I don't want 30 foot fruit trees, 40 foot fruit trees. I can't pick fruit. But if I keep all of my fruit trees down to 8, 10, 12 feet, I'm not getting the benefit of modifying that environment and the cooling effects of an upper canopy level. So by allowing some of these taller trees, the Chippewanas, for example, to grow up as an upper canopy and skirting it up, then that's modifying the environment underneath it, cooling that environment down, and making a, a more pleasant environment to live in, providing the nitrogen as well, and reducing the water needs from your trees. If you have your, your fruit tree out in Santee in full sun at 110 degrees during the summer, transpiration rates are gonna be much, much higher, and you're gonna be using a lot more water than it's, if it's planted as a second story plant has an upper story canopy modifying that environment. 
So, you know, that's a, a big benefit of having that. Um, legume. Like, maybe me. <laughs> you got it. No, uh, nitrogen fixing tree. Uh, is that a follow up to that? Yeah, okay. Is the, uh, the deepness of the roots, is that, uh, is le the legumes are all off the top here, the, the deep roots, that's a good thing for all my trees then? The nitrogen fixing is going on that deep as well? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, basically as, as long as there's air in that soil, you're going to get the nitrogen fixing happening. Uh, but again, you know, because they are deeper rooted, uh, you're going to get organic matter being deposited lower and lower, thereby deepening your soil. Breaking up the soil, improving the aeration and drainage. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, whole host trees. Question back here? Gophers, are uh, stunt plant, onion, or garlic effective to ward off gophers? <laughs> yeah, gophers, you know, depending on what part of time you go. They're cats. <laughs> You know, permaculture, we, we don't look at any one approach. We try to come up with a whole series of approaches to kind of uh, solve that one issue. Um, and so from observations of gophers, I find that in kind of like a forest type system, you don't see the, uh, the gophers nearly as much as you do in more in open spaces. So trees that are all by themselves are much more susceptible than ones that are all planted with a ton of other plants that they can also feed on. So that's, that's one strategy. Uh, second strategy would just be kind of trapping or uh, trying to remove them, uh, mixing in plants. You know, there's a lot of plants that I say gophers won't eat, and I've seen them eat. Um, you know, fencing them off. I'm not, I'm not huge on like caging off a lot of my plants because one, that's expensive, and it's, it's kind of a short-term solution. That you know, over time, once your plants are really established, you're just trying to get them through those very first uh, few years to kind of really get them up and going. And then, you know, gophers, they can eat a little bit here, a little bit there, but as long as they have a lot of other stuff going on and trying to provide that habitat for things that predate on them, you know, that's, that's my strategy. And from the permaculture principles, what you're looking at is you're building the habitat. Bring in your L box, bring in your resting, your, your perching places for your hawks, for your owls. Have your gopher snakes. Um, you know, gophers aren't all bad. From a, from a permacultural standpoint, they serve a function. They're aerating the soil, they're providing manures, you know, they're, they're composting. They're not all bad. So, uh, we have to take more of that whole system approach. A couple more questions here for Joe. Uh, any more questions? A good, a good example of this is Nursery system, ski spanglers, exotic nursery. Mm -hmm. You've been here? Yep. Repeat the question, John. Uh, he was saying that a good example of this would be uh, uh, exotica nursery. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say, yeah, they have a lot of really great fruit trees, but they don't really emphasize too much of the support plants. And I think that's something you see a lot with the uh, people that really are into fruit trees. They plant a lot of them, but they don't necessarily think about how they're going to be providing their long term mulch how they're going to be providing for their pest control and all that kind of stuff. I mean, of course, he has a great diversity and, and it's, it, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. It's highly productive and just really amazing. Uh, I'm all for also thinking about other cool. yields as well. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much.